Oh, I'm alright, son. Came up myself. Went into the shop and that, and got messages, and that's how we talk. <laughs> but uh, I lived in Reading ten years ago, um, twelve years ago, and after a month of everybody going what, I learned how to enunciate because people just looked at me like I was from Mars, and uh, it's so cool to be here. Craig is uh, a good friend. Uh, when I first met Craig, Craig, my life was very, very different. I, uh, I'm a songwriter, full-time songwriter, singer-songwriter, and I travel all over the world these days. And um, I have no idea, well, I do have an idea, but I just never expected to be where I am today, nine years ago, you know? Uh, I hope my phone's off. Unless your phone's in the key of G, can you turn it off? <laughs> you don't need to, I'm only doing that's fine. <laughs> but um, nine years ago, I, uh, I started writing songs nine years ago when I was living in a homeless hostel. I'd been on the streets for about 15 months. And um, it was alcohol and drug addiction that had pretty much taken me from every good thing in my life. Um, and I had a good life, a really good life. I came from a very loving family. We didn't have a lot. We didn't have a lot at all, actually. Um, but you don't need a lot to spoil your kids, you know. I was really loved. Only child. Got it right in the first go. And, uh, <laughs> but um, my mum and dad worked extremely hard to provide. And uh, when I was 15... Um, and the marriage wasn't going great anyway, but we, there was a flood during the winter. It was a cold winter, and it destroyed our house and all our belongings. And uh, my mum had a breakdown, and she left. We didn't know why at the time, but she was really quite sick. And it wasn't until um, sometime after that that uh, she, she told me what had happened because I, I was 15 and life's really intense when you're 15, you know. I, I've got a 15-year-old kid now, you know, so it's just very strange to watch. Um, but he's a good guy, like. But um, so many questions, really emotional, didn't know what to do. My dad and I, um, you know, his job was to keep a roof over our heads, which he did. He used to he used to brag about getting putting dinner together for one pound fifty. <laughs> that was his way, you know. And uh, I was just so confused. I mean, I'd been I'd been a musician since about the age of four. Started playing the guitar properly when I was about six. When I got to secondary school, I was asked to audition for a specialist music school um, in Edinburgh. I got in there. Nobody in my family's musical apart from my great uncle, who was um, a very famous piper. Um, but uh, my family didn't have any idea about it. So I went to this specialist music school, and it was very middle, upper class. You know, I just didn't fit in at all. <laughs> but I could play, play the guitar like it was going out of fashion, you know. And um, when, when things fell apart, because, you know, your, your family's your comfort zone, you know. I just needed to blow off a bit of steam, so I went, I went out partying. I was really good at it as well, you know, and uh, got, got into a bit, have a, I had a drink, just enjoyed having a drink, smoked a bit of weed, but within a year, I was um, hitting the nightclubs pretty hard. This was, this was in the 90s, and uh, it wasn't long before I was on the Class A drugs, hanging about with some questionable folk and uh, I, mean, I loved to party, man. It just made me feel great, you know. I was a much smaller person back then, much better looking, a bit of a charmer. Uh, just an idiot, really. But um, the license, licensing laws in Edinburgh are the bars and clubs are open until 3 a.m., but during the festival, they're open until 5. So we'd go out all night and then we'd leave at 5 o'clock, go and find a chip shop somewhere and then they'd open the pubs again at six and then at half past seven you'd go to school <laughs> I just used to go in completely bladdered 
And um, the guys in school, the popular guys, used to brag about being uh, in the park at the weekends with a bottle of Merry Down cider or whatever. But I was hanging about with folk that, you know, we were taking cocaine and speed, and I thought these guys were idiots. I thought it was the man. But anyway, um, I auditioned for um, a couple of really prestigious uh, music conservatories. Uh, one's Guildhall in London, and uh, the other was um, the Royal Scottish Academy of Music and Drama. I got into the one in Glasgow, and I went there when I was 18. And it was amazing because you're liberated from parental rule, and the banks throw money at you. Have a two grand overdraft, have a credit card. I'm not going to tell you it's not really your, your money, you know. And you get your student loan, and I spent it on really important things like PlayStation 1 and, and beer. Lots of beer. And um, the first year at college was a blur. And when second year came and everybody was knuckling down, I just wanted to party. Um, but by then I was taking so much... Um, drugs at the weekend and uh, I would drink a bottle of vodka before I went out you know I was like 18 19 um, it wasn't long before I started to really st have a bad effect on my life I was quite depressed they put me on tablets and it made it worse man because I just I, I, I tried to commit suicide twice and eventually after three years at the academy they asked me to leave because I wasn't meeting the obligations of my course, man, it was such a waste, you know. So I found my answer on a bottle of vodka and I punched a wall so hard that it, it broke the bones in my hand and that was my classical guitar career effectively over. So I ran away. This does get better, by the way, right? <laughs> Just hang in there, we'll get through it. Um, I ran away and en ended up in Thailand, as you do, uh, where it's 60 pence a bottle of whiskey. And it's not really whiskey, it's more like formaldehyde. It's really bad stuff. Or you could get a beer for 15 pence, you know, wonderful. And I spent a year pickling myself in this Thai whiskey. And I was hospitalized twice. I lost 30 kilos in weight, which is a lot, man. You know, if you, your, your, your luggage that you take to the airport is about 20 kilos. So I lost 30 kilos. I went from about 115 to under 90 kilos. I mean, I was a skinny boy, like. Eventually, the authorities got in touch with my mother and said, you have to come and get him because he's, we're going to put him in hospital. She came and got me. She didn't let me drink. And I didn't have, I'd never experienced the withdrawals before. And then in Bangkok airport, before we were coming home, I started hallucinating. I thought I was dying, everything was a hundred times louder. I ran out the airport punching myself because I couldn't feel anything. And I ran into the bar and I drank a half bottle of whiskey and a couple of beers before my mum saw me. And that got me on the plane. But on the plane, I couldn't look at people in the face because they all looked like they wanted to hurt me. I thought people were wanting to kill me. So I spent the 13 hour flight coming back under a blanket, crying my eyes out with earplugs in. And by the time I got to um, Edinburgh, I was in such a state, they put me into a psychiatric hospital. And uh, I'd had such a bad nervous breakdown, I couldn't walk into the kitchen when the washing machine was on because I was so frightened by the noise. I couldn't look outside the window. I couldn't look at anybody. And this is a sharp contrast for, to the guy that would drink. And me, I was such a confident guy when I had a bit of booze, but complete coward without it, but uh, I lasted six weeks until I decided that I was going to be homeless so I could start drinking again on top of this really mind-bending medication they gave me, you know, and it was just, that's when stuff got really bad. <laughs> I, um, the council are great, they give you a room and a bed and breakfast with a TV, back in the day the TVs actually had stuff coming out the back, you know, and one working channel. And I drank my fortnightly benefit in one day, just got, got rid of it. So I pawned my 2,000 pound guitar for 100 quid to buy drugs. I did that with all of my stuff. And um, <coughs> I 
when I ran out of stuff to sell, I started begging. And I started stealing. I mean, I've done stuff for money that I never ever imagined having to do, you know. It's amazing what you'll do when you're desperate. And when with, the, with the booze on these drugs, I was a violent guy. I just wanted to fight people. I wanted people to hurt me. Because I couldn't feel anything. I'd get banned from the homeless hostel, so I'd sleep outside. Or wherever I could, you know. I slept in burnt-out cars, wheelie bins, graveyards. Anywhere you could, you know. It wasn't so much about staying warm, it was about staying dry. Because if you got wet, it was, I mean, you were in hospital. Easy. Sleeping out rough in the winter of 2005 was the worst thing I've ever experienced because the cold tries to kill you slowly and it is so painful you feel like you're on fire. And you put a bit of uh, bad mental health and alcohol and drug withdrawal into that and it's just a nightmare. So I started to self-abuse. I know there's kids here, so I'll, I'll keep it. I used to mutilate myself, so I had to go into hospital. And um, I did some really crazy stuff. Like, And one time I woke up, and the person I'd been drinking and taking drugs with was dead. And then I knew I was either going to change or I was going to die. And it was then I tried to look for help, and I tried the AA, great organization. I've known people that have been sober 25 years plus. But for me, just sitting in a room talking about booze made me want to go and drink, you know. I looked at rehab. There was one in the borders. It was £10,000. A bit unrealistic if you're homeless, you know. And then I came across Bethany. And I, came, I went in. They fed me. They told me what they did. It's a recovery program, but it's a Christian recovery program. I was like, I don't care. <laughs> I just need something. So they said, right, well, take a few days to dry out because you can't come in hammered. It's for the other guys. So I did that. And on the 13th of February, 2006, they gave me a bed. And I remember that day really well because the England rugby team had just smashed the Scottish once again. And uh, I couldn't go drinking, <laughs> which is any excuse, you know. And that was the first night there, and it was a hard night because I was sober. And you didn't know what to do with yourself. And I, would, I just started thinking about how did I lose it all? How did I end up here? You spend your first week drying out, but they had a guitar at the center, and it was rubbish. I mean, it was you could only call it a guitar because it had strings on it. And the truth is, if it was worth more than 50 pence, it would have ended up in cash converter, you know. In these homeless hostels, if it's not nailed to the floor, I mean, you, you do, you see bits of carpet going missing, and you're like, why would you take a bit of carpet? <laughs> it's just insane. But um, I started writing songs, pretty dark stuff about being homeless, being an, al an addict. And I wasn't doing it to anybody to try and impress them. I'd never written songs before. I'd never played with a plectrum. I'd never, um, I was a purist. I was a classical guitarist. Let's call it a cheater. And um, I just started writing stuff. And it, it was weird because it all just came out, everything, all of it. And uh, I'll do you one song that I wrote because you look like you're on the edge. And, uh, <laughs> but, uh, Sorry, I crack jokes when I'm a bit nervous, like, but, um... sound alright? So this is the first song I ever wrote. It's called Alcoholic Synonymous because that's what I was. And this is uh, my day in the life of an addict. And it's 
being an addict, a full-time job, don't get paid, there's no holidays. You know what I mean? So but this, is, this is called Alcoholics Anonymous. Something was wrong, I felt so bad Needed hair of the dog Oh, what did I do last night? I looked round the room with my half-opened eyes But all I could see were empty bottles of wine Tell me, what did I say last night? I made my way to the bathroom door But I was so, so sick I just fell on the floor, yeah My body had given in And I was so cold that I started to shiver The sweat was pouring out of me fast as a river Sit back and let the show begin Oh, stand up, get up off your knees You gotta go the distance to put yourself at ease And I'm singing again Cause I need that drink of mine Or I will surely die Sweet spirit in the sky Ooh. Well I was up and I was dressed by quarter past eight And they were already selling, I was already late But everything's gonna be just fine but I couldn't find shoes, I couldn't find them anywhere I said, damn it, man, I just headed up the stairs And out of the door, barefoot, I ran into the light And I'm walking down the road with my coppers in hand My mind is working double time to create a master plan, yeah Oh, what was my excuse today? The world was closing in I started to shudder The noise became unbearable I threw up in the gutter And I motioned you to get out my way And then a sigh Sigh of relief Standing in a doorway On a familiar street and I'm singing again Cause I need that drink of mine Or I will surely die Sweet spirit in the sky Ooh. So I'm standing there At my top shelf and just for a sec I think of drinking something else But that'll never come to pass Four big bottles of wine, a cheap bottle of cider Don't care what I'm drinking, see I'm none for the wiser I've just got to get home and find a dirty glass and the minutes pass by Four, five, six, seven By the time I get to ten I'm in my own little heaven, yeah Oh, my water relief And first came the laughter And then came the sadness And then I get locked up again Cause anger turned to madness And then I start to question my beliefs Oh, and then I said I fall 
I fall to my knees and I pray forgiveness. Won't you save me, please? Cause I'm fading away and I, I'm gonna die. If I can get myself dry, sweet spirit in the sky. Or I will dream and then I'll wake And my demons will come and take The life that I threw away Oh, the life that I threw away And it again so really cheerful stuff you know I'm actually really fortunate there's a real appreciation for depressing music in Britain it's usually in the pub I actually cut my teeth singing in the pubs and clubs singing these songs um, and they were very well, well received from uh, guys at the bar you know I'm singing about how drinking drugs destroy your life and so say, alright you know, thanks a good song son there's a pub called the Port of Leith. You remember, Craig? Uh, and it's literally the pub from Star Wars minus the lightsabers. <laughs> it is wild. And you, you do dodge the odd shoe, you know, when you're singing in there. And uh, the, 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 the pub's actually run by a, a wee lass. She's that height. And if anything kicks off, she's on the bar with her shillelagh, you know. It was just wild. But... Uh, yeah, those are the kind of places you just go in and, and sing your heart, you know what I mean? But um, I wrote loads of stuff like that. And um, they're all quite hard-hitting and uh, for different things. I wrote, I, wrote, I wrote about a lot of stuff. Um, Bethany was a dry house, which means you couldn't be on anything that was considered addictive. Unless, uh, like things like Valium, they wouldn't allow them unless the doctor specifically said he needs to be on them, you know, because it could have been somebody else's problem. But they were really good with stuff like that. But I saw a lot of guys come in and they'd have to go through the withdrawals cold turkey. I don't know if you've ever witnessed somebody going cold turkey from heroin. It is one of the most horrible things. There's a guy called Robert that was there, and like for three days he was in absolute agonising pain. Is he just getting out of his chair? It was rotten. And he came into the room when we were playing pool, and he had a seizure standing on his feet, and he fell forward, and he had a fit for about seven minutes. It was really frightening. And then he woke up, and he was fine. But you know, the truth is that sometimes when people have these seizures, they don't get back up. You know, that's the end of it. Like you know, so um, he inspired this next song. It's called the. The rattle of a lustful thought, and um, addicts use the term rattling um, when they're withdrawing because you feel like a penny in a box until you get your next fix. You do. And uh, this was inspired by Robert. Um, he was a lovely boy. And uh, I know I said I was only going to play one depressing song, but I've got to think I'll play another one. <coughs> Anybody see it? Is that Always happens. Phone, wallet, keys, sat on it. <laughs> Sunrise eyes Caught between the lines and emotions Silent tears That only seem to fear my reflections 
I get so cold inside when there's nowhere left to run. The world is closing in. I should have bought myself a gun. I'm stuck in real time, and I'm coming down, down, down. By tomorrow, the sun ain't gonna shine. And I'm so cold, I'm feeling numb, numb, numb. By tomorrow, I'll be staring at the setting sun. I wish I could have been someone, but I was caught by the rattle of a lustful thought. Seeds are sown, listening to my own words of wisdom. You see, I lost my smile, and with it went my fragile sense of reason. And I get so cold inside when there's nowhere left to run. The world is closing in. I should have bought myself a gun. I'm stuck in real time, and I'm coming down, down, down. And by tomorrow, the sun ain't gonna shine. And I'm so cold, I'm feeling numb, numb, numb. By tomorrow, I'll be staring at the setting sun. I wish I could have been someone, but I was caught by the rattle of a lustful thought. And as I stand, I see the system take control. 'Cause I could have it all, yeah, I could have it all. The wheels are turning, yes, and I begin to lose my ball. Watch out, where I'm far from trouble. I'm far from subtle. I'm stuck in real time, coming down, down, down. By tomorrow, the sun ain't gonna shine. I'm so cold. I'm feeling numb, numb, numb. And by tomorrow, I'll be staring at the setting sun. Wish I could have been someone, but I was caught by the rattle of a lustful thought. I'm stuck in real time, and I'm coming down. And by tomorrow, the sun ain't gonna shine. I'm so cold. I'm feeling numb. And by tomorrow, I'll be staring at the setting sun. I wish I could have been someone, but I was caught by the rattle of a lustful thought. Ooh. Thanks very much. So um, I'll do a blues. Do you, like the, do you like the blues? I love the blues. Blues is great because the blues was invented by guys sitting on their porch with their guitars moaning about stuff. Um, brilliant. And uh, basically, to sing a blues, you need three chords and a problem, and you're sorted. And uh, a large part of addiction is. Um, Being in denial. Even if you're not an, an addict, you can run away from your problems, you know. And even when you're presented with the right solution, you tend to do the wrong thing. It's human nature, and you convince yourself that no matter how bad or how wrong you're going to do it, it work itself out, and it doesn't. And there's a a term they use in the casinos. It's uh, In one of the games, it's uh, snake eyes. It's when you throw a double one, and that's a that's a complete fail. But your loss is staring right back at your face, you know. And that's this song's called Snake Eyes, and it's about running away from your problems or the fire. 
But the truth is, if you don't stand and turn and face your problems, you, you stand absolutely no chance of overcoming them. You've got to face it. And I ran away for years. But, uh, this is the last depressing song, I promise. But the blues is cool because you can sing about depressing stuff and it still sounds kind of great. You all right? Good stuff. What's that? Here, here, here. Just moving about, I'm a bumbling fool. Raging waters have been running through my soul. Raging waters have been running through my soul. Drown me in agony, tenderly and slow. Raging waters have been running through my soul. Yeah, I'm overcome. See how I run Feels like that heat is coming to get me Don't look now, it's a while before the fire burns Feels like that heat is coming to burn me, yeah And I sold my soul and I took another roll of the dice I take a look at them snake eyes Take a look at them snake eyes mm -hmm. There's a silence hanging in my heart An empty silence hanging in my heart And the tears I cry bled me dry Pulling me apart There's a silence hanging in my heart mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm overcome See how I run Feels like that heat is coming to get me Don't look now, it's a while before the fire burns Feels like that heat is coming to burn me, yeah And I sold my soul and I took another roll of dice Take a look at them snake eyes mm, Take a look at them snake eyes
Now shame has cast a shadow over me Oh, shame has cast a shadow over me And I won't deny that I have lied to color what you see Shame has cast a shadow over me Yeah, I'm overcome See how I run Feels like that heat is coming to get me Don't look now, it's a while before the fire burns Feels like that heat is coming to burn me But I sold my soul when I took another roll of dice Take a look at them snake eyes, whoa Take a look at them snake eyes mm. So I like the blues I've got a band and we're all pretty big guys, you know Depending on the stability of the stage, we'll gently bob. Um, coming from a Baptist church, it normally means you're standing on a bath. So you've got to watch what you're doing. But if there's a good bit of open space, it opens up the possibility of choreography and uh, ninjutsu. Wonderful. Um, anyway. The best part of getting sober is you get your appetite back. And you can probably tell I'm not a fuss eater. I, uh, I really like a lot of food. Craig's uh, good wife cooked us a monstrous meal the night. Oh, I don't even have the words to describe how good it was. But by the fourth helping, it was really going down well. Like, <laughs> and uh, I even got to clean the meat off the bone. Uh, that's, not, that's not a lie. I really did that. But, um, Bethany would get food donated by lots of cool folk like Marks and Spencers, which wasn't too bad, you know. You remember the TV advert with the chocolate cake that made you want to go and lick the TV? Yeah. So we had some good food, some good times. And you put on a bit of weight, develop the Bethany belly, we called it. Still got mine. And uh, it's a healthy sign of recovery. You start to look a bit more. You get your colour back and a bit, a bit of weight and what's, whatnot. And y you would do your groups, which were really good, actually. Some one-to-one -one sessions. But again, it was very sort of Christian, and I just wasn't into that at all. So I just kind of politely said nothing. And uh, in the afternoons, Bethany would invite you to do stuff to go to the cinema, play football, go to the park, go fishing, walking, other stuff, just regular normal things that you might do. But these are completely abnormal for being a, for an addict. You wouldn't go to the cinema because that's a bottle of vodka, you know. And you wouldn't go to the park unless you had booze on you already. <laughs> your entire life is dictated by your addiction, who you're going to see, the places that you're going to try and find money, the people that you're with, if you had money, Everybody was your best friend until it ran out, you know. That's just the way it was. And uh, so it was quite weird doing stuff. You, you took a massive part of your life out of the equation and uh, you had this big void. You didn't know what to do with yourself. But Bethany would also occasionally invite you to the, the odd Christian event. You know, they're a Christian charity. And that's what Christians do. They invite you to Christian things. And... Uh, I would politely decline on every occasion. But uh, one night, they put up a poster saying, uh, come and hear a man's testimony. And it was in a really posh hotel, and it was five course dinner. Five courses. 
I come from a wee uh, fishing town called Musselburgh, and if you had three courses, you were doing well, you know, which is normally your Christmas day, you'd have your soup or your prawn cocktail, and then you'd have your turkey and that, and then you'd have a bit of ice cream at the end. I mean, that's the, that's the kind of family that I grew up with, you know. So I, did, I couldn't for the life think what the other two courses would be. So if, out of naturally, natural curiosity, I went along to the meeting, you know, to see what it would be. And I was a little bit disappointed that the last course was a cup of coffee. <laughs> but, but there you go. But just as we were finishing up, um, this guy stood up and started to talk, church minister, because they'd, they'd lured us in with the promise of food. And just as we were finishing, you know, that's when... They couldn't get out, you know, with the st people standing at the doors and stuff. Not really, not really. But um, church minister had the dog collar, you know. I went, oh man, I said, uh, here we go again. This guy's going to tell me how righteous he is and how unrighteous I am and that, how I need what he, he's got. And I'd heard it from Craig and the folk in Bethany and I was like, Damn, man, you know. I was like, right, here we go. We've got to sit and listen to this guy. And I was actually really shocked to hear what came out of his mouth because when this guy had been younger, he'd been a really bad guy. And I thought church ministers were stand-up, law-abiding people that never did anything wrong. That's a stereotype, you know. But he'd been a gangster, a professional thief, um... He nearly murdered somebody and he spent quite a bit of time in jail for that. Heavily addicted to drugs. Um, I could relate to a lot of the stuff that he was talking about, actually. And uh, he said he got to a point when he was in prison and he was like, is this the best I've got to offer? Is this, what, is this, is this, is this all I'm good for? Is this what I'm worth? And he cried out and he just said, you know, God, if you're really there, you've got to do something. Well, the next week he was visited by the prison chaplain, you know. He said, how you doing? And he started talking, and, and that relationship grew, and he became a Christian. And he started talking about his faith, and it was, for the first time, I didn't cringe when I heard the word Bible or Jesus or whatever, you know. It was actually, it sounded all right, what he was saying and stuff. And he spoke about stuff that I'd never heard before. He said, um, God gave him the strength to break the chains that were killing him. And the courage to walk away from that life and to start living a new one, reborn in Christ. Now, I'd never heard anything like that. I didn't even understand what he was going on about, to be honest with you. But what he said next, I'll never forget, because he said there was freedom in Christ. There's different types of prison. My prison was the horizon. I ran all the way around to the other side of the world and I was still a prisoner. But if you speak to any prisoner, any prisoner at all, about the possibility of freedom, they'll give you their undivided attention. They will, because I've been in prisons all over the world. And, I, you know, I've said to the guys, if I told you you could get out tomorrow, would you listen to what I have to say? They'd be like, yeah. Obviously, I don't. But I could tell you how to get free in another way. And this is what this guy said. He said, there's no such thing as 50% free. You want to be free in Christ, you've got to give him everything. Everything, all or nothing. And I was like, I really want that. I'm excited. I want it. But it means turning my back on a lot of stuff that I didn't believe. <laughs> you know? I knew what it was all about. But I decided, you know what? Things kind of get much worse, so I'm going to go and do it. I went up and I prayed. And I wasn't in a Bible. I wasn't in a church. I wasn't reading the Bible. And I just said, you know, God, if you can hear me, if you can hear me, <laughs> taking a real step of faith, I just want a life worth living, you know. And if that means following you, then I'll give it a go. Now, I'm a skeptical Christian, very skeptic, question everything. I think it's partly to do because I'm a bit mental, right, but... Um, I can't deny the things that have happened in my life, though. I can't. When I prayed that prayer, I felt a sense of peace wash over me. And I 
know that doesn't sound like much, but see, when you've lived in fear for 10 years, to suddenly feel peace and calm. I would never felt peace as an adult before, ever. The kind of peace, you know, when you're a kid and you don't have to worry about anything else except who's going and goes. That kind of peace, you know. Because you knew where you were going to get your dinner and you knew where you were going home. And I didn't realize how heavy the burden was that I'd been carrying, the fear, the shame. I couldn't look myself in the mirror without punching it or spitting it or hurting myself. I've got scars all over my body. And uh, the fury, man, just relentless fury. And, and, you know, when, when, when you get that angry, you just feel like a knot, you just kind of get any tighter. And it just felt like somebody lifted it from my soul. And it just completely broke me. Like, it just, just f flattened me. I didn't say anything else for the rest of that night. And I went from a guy that looked in at themselves, which is the nature of addiction, to suddenly looking out at something, I'll be very honest with you, I didn't understand. I didn't, I didn't understand, but all I do know is I'd prayed, I took a step of faith, and something happened. I've got a wee song about that. Are you all right? You're awfully quiet, like. <laughs> if anybody's got any questions at any time, just feel free, like. This is a song called When I Found Jesus. Where did it go this time? Yeah. This is why you should stand up and have pockets. I found Jesus He was holding on to me I was broken I couldn't stand on my own two feet He said a word and broke my chains And I was free to breathe again My life was saved by the love and blood of Jesus When I found Jesus, he was standing over me. I was down an hour and I was living on the streets. There were times that I could have died, sure, but the Lord was by my side. And I didn't know it then, but I was saved by the blood of Jesus. Mm. He took the weight off my shoulders He came and gave me a rest Gave me peace from my troubles Oh Lord, I have been blessed Oh my Lord, I have been blessed When I found Jesus he was walking next to me On the lonely path of my mind made destiny He must have looked into my eyes And saw the tears and heard my cries For where I stood I was saved by the blood of Jesus mm. The empty promises of the world had forsaken me. He 
left me in a wilderness It was Jesus who rescued me He called my name And now I would never be the same, no Just one touch from the King of Kings It changes everything He changes everything, oh When I found Jesus He was heavy on my heart Oh, I was lost for words I didn't know where to start And all I know As I believe, the more than that I have received. For my sins were paid by the love and blood of Jesus. I was saved by the blood of Jesus. He took the weight off my shoulders. He came and gave me rest Gave me peace from my troubles Lord, I have been blessed Lord, I have been blessed Lord, I have been blessed Oh, my Lord, I have been blessed My Lord, I have been blessed My Lord, I have been blessed. Thank you very much. I've got to be very honest with you, though. Um, nothing changed when I became a Christian. It wasn't like uh, abracadabra. Here's a nice Glaswegian wife. Or... Th Three beautiful kids, or um, a bed, a house. I mean, I've got some really cool stuff to do, you know. It's, I, I mean, I'm not rich or anything, but um, I consider myself a very wealthy man. Um, but when I was when I when I became a Christian, I was still homeless. I had one change of clothes, um, no contact with family friends. A list of problems you couldn't shake a stick at, and uh, I didn't even have a bank account because I got myself into so much debt, you know. But I didn't think I was the first, the center of the universe anymore, which is, you know, the way I used to be. And the guy that preached that night is a guy called Cammy McKenzie. He's an absolute nutter, um, but <laughs> but he's a great man of God. He goes into the prisons and he goes out in the streets and you know speaks to the kids that are in the gangs and stuff, you know, and because because he's been there. He's done some incredible things in the in the in the, in the Scottish prisons, and uh, helping these guys, re you know, reform when they come back out. Because a lot of the times when they come out, they go back straight back into the same things that they've gone in for, you know. And um, but Cammy said to me, he said, "Do you really think if you weren't an addict, you wouldn't have problems?" He says, "Life's hard, you know. Life's tough, but you can rise to the challenge." He said, you need to be on your knees and praying every day, asking God for strength and guidance. But always thank him for the cross first. And I said, well, you know what? I prayed once so, and something happened, so I'll give it a go. And I did. I was on my, my knees in my wee room. Wasn't it the Ritz like? A wee homeless hostel bedroom. But it was my room. And I sat there and I prayed. And I did find strength. And I know that doesn't sound like a lot. You see, when you've been powerless to addiction for 10 years, finding a bit of strength is a miracle, man. He, instead of reaching for a bottle, I was picking up a Bible. And I went and started doing the groups. And when he spoke about this guy called Jesus and love and compassion, forgiveness and stuff, it actually meant something to me. I mean, it really meant something to me. And I started to look at life and I started to get hungry and I was excited. And I, I don't know if you've ever met guys in recovery they suddenly get this glow about them. 
You know what I mean? Like they've been dead for years, but they get this glow about them. But they're just they're so alive. They really are so alive. And I was like that. And I spent eight months getting clean in the rehab. It was the hardest thing I've ever done, honestly, because you've got to change. You've really got to change everything. I apologised to a lot of people. Some of them said you can get to France. You know, I had to accept that. Um, I've hurt a lot of folk. And some of them said, we forgive you. You're an idiot, but we love you. Um, I think the hardest apology was to my mum and dad. They'd heard every excuse, honestly, every excuse except I found Jesus. You know, and they just, I think, they, they, I don't think they believe me. They just said, we found God, son, good for you. You'd been sober more than six weeks. That's all they bothered about. But you should see their faces when they come round to my house today. I don't have to say anything because my kids are a witness to the grace of God. I never knew or thought anything good could come from me ever when I was doing some of the things I did when I was homeless to get drink or to get money, that anything precious could, could come from me and yet every day I get to look into the eyes of my daughters and I don't have the words to accurately tell you how that makes me feel. It's a wonderful thing. So I'm going to sing a wee song that I didn't write. I hope you don't mind. Um, it's, it's my favourite song. I sing it at all my gigs. It's by a band called One Direction. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, not really. Um, I, I, I've heard this split, though. Isn't that amazing? Wow. When my daughter started school this year, she went to school with a One Direction bag. I felt like a failure as a father. <laughs> I had a black satchel with Led Zeppelin on it. Not really, but... <laughs> um, this song was written by another bad guy. But I sing it every day, everywhere I go. It doesn't matter what I'm doing. <laughs> I actually burst into a um, sp spontaneous song on a plane about three weeks ago, flying to the Isle of Uist, where my family are. They cancelled the ferry because of the storm, and for some reason they said, you know, we'll fly there. And so, so I paid the ridiculous amount of money, and we did it. And some crazy American was like, there's going to be some lumps and bumps, and we're just going to get there, don't worry. And I was like, right, okay. And it was... And it, this plane is a bathtub with wings, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's actually, st it still had propellers on it, right? So you had women screaming, right? Like, right there. There's a couple standing, sort of sitting beside me, and they're like this. You know, just not moving at all, and they're just like this Madame Two Souls or something like that. You know? and, uh, and I'm like, amazing grace! <laughs> and it was ferocious, and then see when it landed, Everybody burst into rapturous applause, you know, and they, 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 I never saw the guy coming out, but I bet he would have come out and went, <laughs> honestly, he must have done, it was, it was amazing, and uh, honestly, I just, I, I, I went and tweeted this, is we've just had the Indiana Jones landing, right, and ironically, later that day, Harrison Ford crashed his plane, <laughs> isn't that mental, but uh, yeah, but that said, uh, don't fly to the Western Isles. Seriously, right? You're, you, you, but you'll get your money's worth, though. <laughs> Seriously, you know? It was wild. I've never been in a plane class. Oh, yeah. So anyway, they, they got a few verses of Amazing Grace because I thought I was going to die. And uh, so this is a, it's a great song if you're scared, like, you know. So this is, <laughs> this is Amazing Grace. Sorry. Sorry, I had to share that. Ach, I'll do it a wee bit bluegrass. Do you like blue, bluegrass? The sound that saved a wretch like me 
I once was lost, but now I am found. I was blind, but now I see. It was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did your grace appear the hour I first believed. My chains have gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, He has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing grace. The Lord, He has promised so good. To me, his word, my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, He has ransomed me. Oh, when like a flood, His mercy reigns. Oh, unending love, amazing grace. Mm. How soon is all like snow? The sun forbear to shine. But God, who called me here below, He will be forever mine. My chains have gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, He has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love. Did you, did you like that little bit of black magic there? With the, this is a, a really amazing bit of kit. I don't even use half of what it's used for, but it's, it, it's basically amazing because you never know what kind of setup you're going to. This is a, an amazing room for music because you've got the big bits of wood and nice carpet. You, 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 sh you should probably hire it out as a, a drum session place. It'd be amazing. you make a fortune. But uh, this is, um, yeah, this was amazing. Um, you, if you, what it does is it listens to the, the, the melody and then it listens to the chords on the guitar and then it harmonizes it around it. It's just ridiculous. So you've got... Or... But the really impressive thing was trying to convince my wife that I needed it, you know? <laughs> right, so... so cause, uh, but being a Glaswegian, she actually sent me to the shop and try to try every cheaper alternative, you know. <laughs> so it was, uh, you know. But Amazon Prime, guys, if you're into guitar stuff, Amazon Prime is great because you justify it when it arrives, you know. Because you can't give it back to the guy, you know. So I, I really need it, darling, you know, it's so pretty. 
guitar effects pedals and stuff like that, you know. So, I mean, how are we doing for time? Is it good? It's been, um, it's been nine years since I've, uh, since I gave my, my life to the Lord and left the center. And um, Craig baptized me on the 27th of February, 2006. My entire family came to the church. And now I am a McLeod. There's millions of us, right? We just seem to breed. And, uh, and uh, but my mum's side of the family, who are Wilsons, they came as well. And they came in and they'd never been in a Baptist church. One of them said, uh, I've never been in a rock church before because it had guitars in it. And I was like, right, okay. But they all came along. They all came along because they did see me in my worst. They'd seen me and they, they actually saw this new person, you know, because I completely changed. And I always remember getting baptized and coming out of the water. And the first thing I saw at the back of the room was my dad, right at the back with the biggest smile on his face. I'll never forget that, you know, it was just, it was just lovely. And um, I remember for the rest of that day, just sitting out the back garden, I never felt cleaner in my life, you know. So it must have been good water, good stuff in the water, like, you know. Um, when I left the center, I'd, I'd met my wife, Jane. Jane, uh, I met her about a week after becoming a Christian, and she invited me to the church. So it was good timing. And then uh, she had a seven-year-old wee boy called James who was crackers, and uh, I just fell in love with him. But, I mean... We just started out as friends because I was trying to get my life in order. But when I left the center, I told her that I fancied her. And she said, I fancy you too. I said, right, so let's get married. And we did in eight weeks. Remember, Craig? Yeah, I, left, I left on the 2nd of October and we got married on the 2nd of December. My mum and dad nearly had a stroke. <laughs> right, honestly, it was just crazy. But... The funny thing that happened was um, Jane's birthday is on the same date as my cousin Sarah's birthday, and Sarah's like a sister to me, and they always go to my grands. I mean, there's millions of us. I can't really describe it. There's just millions of us. Eh? And my mum phoned me up, and she said, are you coming to Sarah's birthday? And I says, well, it's actually Jane's birthday, so I'm going to do something with her. And she says, well, why don't you bring her down? So I did. And when, when we arrived, my entire family had bought a present for both Jane and James. And you know what? That's when I suddenly realised how much I appreciate my family because not everybody's got that, you know. I knew I knew a guy called Paul who was in the centre who'd been abused as a child, um, and uh, there was a lot of anger there. But he became a Christian and he found out what it really was to forgive, and he moved on with his life. He went to Bible school. He actually ended up back at the, the centre as a as one of the mentors there and one of the counsellors. And then he married a girl, had a kid, and then they went off to India, and now they're now missionaries. <laughs> it's just amazing, you know, um, the power of forgiveness. But I really appreciated my family then. But Jane um, Jane worked full-time. I was the house husband, so I had breakfast with James every morning. And, you know, he told me how un environmentally friendly I was and stuff like that. You know, it's amazing what seven-year-olds get into their brains. But um, I started gigging, uh, doing pubs and clubs and stuff but I was fine the drinking that didn't bother me because I'd, I'd sorted all that out I could drink but I didn't go in unless I had a gig the guy that interviewed me for the centre the manager is also my best mate and he's now my bass player is a guy called Dave Biddulph and uh, he's got a couple of daughters now as well so we go on daddy daughter dates and uh, we have a great time at Deep Sea World and all these ridiculously fun places I think we, me and Dave go just because we get to f have so much fun and the girls think we're just ridiculous but there you go um, but about 2009 I got asked to write some songs for a music ministry in Edinburgh called Origin Scotland and I wrote um, three songs it was the same time when Dave was getting married and he said would you write something for us when we sign the register, the registry papers I went I, I'd never written anything to do with my faith up until that point the, the song When I Found Jesus came later um, so I'd I, it wasn't a, a difficult song to write because I just looked at my wife and saw what God had given me. She's a good woman, Craigie. Eh? And uh, I fell in love with my wife's love for God. I'd never seen that before, ever. And it was just contagious, and I wanted it. 
and it just felt right and pure. And um, we got married. We basically turned up. The church helped us out a big deal. My mum had delusions of this grand, grand wedding. I said, no, we're just going to turn up, be there or not. It's up to you. And everybody came. Everybody was there. We had such an amazing time. And uh, it's without doubt the best thing I've ever done is marry my Jane. And um, so when I wrote Hallelujah for Dave and Wendy, it was actually about my wife, Jane. So I'm going to sing that for you, if you don't mind. Because she's at home looking after three kids. But if it wasn't for what she does, I wouldn't get to come and do what I do, you know. So This is from my missus. We are one, we are one, we are one in the Lord, we will love, for the Father loved us first, we love in the name of the Lord, singing hallelujah, hallelujah. Singing hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah in the name of the Lord. Mm. We will stand, we will stand, we will stand as one in the name of the Lord. We unite forever as his faithful bride. We stand in the name of the Lord. Singing hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah in the name of the Lord. Singing hallelujah, Jesus, hallelujah. Hallelujah in the name of the Lord. Mm -hmm. All I am, all I am, all I am is yours in the name of the Lord. Together we'll follow in the steps of the one who rose up from the depths. Yes, he rose so we could love in the name of the Lord. And singing hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah in the name of the Lord. Oh, singing hallelujah, hallelujah. going to finish with a couple of songs, is that all right? Um, there's a, I've met a lot of weird people in the last nine years, you know, they're, they're all Christians. Um, I'm a bit weird, I was telling Craig about some of my hobbies today, he thought it was nuts. Um, but that's the beauty of it, we're all individually made and we all have our own personality traits and stuff like that, you know what I mean? 
But I know this one guy, he's a part-time minister, part-time bomb disposal expert. So he blows stuff up Monday to Saturday and then preaches really loudly on the Sunday. Not, not really, but, um, but his, his, his actual job title is counter-terrorism expert. So he actually works for um, various organizations, including GCHQ. If you don't know where GCHQ is, that's where James Bond works. <laughs> um, he helped out with uh, the aftermath of 9-11. He does the stuff in Afghanistan. But his, his testimony is amazing. He, uh, he, he had a contract put out on him by the IRA. He's Irish. And, um, because he predicted all the places that they were going to bomb and made them less lethal, saving scores of lives. So on the third attempt on his life, they actually killed the guy that borrowed his car that day. And uh, they shipped him out of Ireland to England. And he's, he's got more, more story, but he's music daft, absolutely mentally daft when it comes to music. And um, he's a great man of God. And uh, I was doing a few things about two or three years in my, my Christian walk that I shouldn't have been doing, you know, nothing illegal. Uh, I was smoking about 40 cigarettes a day. Um, when I quit drinking, the doctor said, you don't want to do too much too soon. So I was like, no bother. And when my wife was like, you know, I can't stand the smell. I, I, I really can't stand you smoking. I was like, it's doctor's orders, you know. Didn't go down well, honestly. Um, and I was into a lot of scratch cards in a big way, you know. I didn't, I didn't see much. But the truth is, as a Christian, these things don't honor God, you know. Um... And my friend said to me, he says, look, mate, sometimes we can put our own little bits of grace on the things that we want, you know, like um, our own little bits of forgiveness, like white lies, you know, they're still lies, but because they think they're just little ones, it's not bad. Um, and then he asked me a series of questions, which I'll rephrase because his name's Simon, and I don't want to say anything Simon said. Um, <laughs> But I believe wholeheartedly that Jesus Christ is the Lord of King and heaven, uh, heaven and earth. He's the only king I've ever heard of that left his kingdom for his people. He wasn't born into a palace of gold and silver and marble, but the squalor of a borrowed stable to show his people he was humble enough to go anywhere for them. He changed the world in a very short space of time, and some people say it was about three years, but he did it. And he w didn't use a sword or an army or persecution or oppression. He did it with love, wisdom, compassion, and the truth. Now, I dare you to find somebody else in history that's done that. Don't take my word for it. I'm just a muso. I dare you to go and find somebody that's done better. You'll be hard pushed, like, because back in those days, the guy with the bigger, bigger stick was in charge. But in the wake of Jesus' love, everything changed. And even if you're not a Christian, that's a fact. Um, there was also people that didn't like Jesus that also wrote about him. It's not just in the Bible. So if you don't believe me, I dare you to go and find out for yourself. He basically came and taught us the meaning of life. He did great things. He reached out to the lost and to the broken. But that wasn't enough. You see, all the stuff that we've done, that we've done to mess up, all the bad stuff that we've done, the guilt, the shame, the fear, whatever. He decided that instead of us taking the consequences of that, which is death, he knowingly gave his life on a cross and became everything that we could possibly have done wrong so that in giving his life, it died with him. And then he rose from the grave out of the shadows of hell to prove to the world that he really was who he said he was. And if you put your trust and faith in him, we'll never perish and we'll dwell with him for eternity. And my friend said, do you believe that? And I went, yeah, I do. And he says, well, how can you look at yourself in the mirror? Call yourself a Christian and still do these things when you know what Jesus has done for you. And that hit me like a brick wall. That's the kind of guy Simon is when he preaches. He just comes up and weathers you. So the train back from Northampton that day was a long and slow journey, and I wrote a prayer, which I turned into a song, which I'm going to play. And the moral of the story is, 
don't judge Christ by my standards because I fall very short of the standards of God, like, you know, because I'm, I'm just a bloke. But um, I do know that when I endeavor to be Christ-like, he brings the best out in me. And he completely changed me. You can ask my mum and dad, they're on Facebook, what I used to be like, honestly. My mum and dad just can't believe it, you know. But um, I wrote this song, it's called Lord Have Mercy. And it just kind of put everything into perspective. It still does sometimes, you know. I mean, so I'll do this and maybe a wee song at the end and we'll say goodnight. Is that all right? When I fall, I am renewed. When I'm discouraged, your love shines true. In my troubles, Lord, you lend a hand and pull me through. But I'm still a sinful man. In the things that I do Lord have mercy Have mercy on me I surrender From down here on my knees Forgive my weakness Lord Forgive my selfish need Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy on me. And I am unworthy, I am unworthy of your love. And still you pour it down on me from heaven above. There is no question how long to be true to you, but I'm still a sinful man in the things that I do. Lord, have mercy, have mercy on me. I surrender down here on my knees. Forgive my weakness, Lord, forgive my selfish need. Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy on me. I know the price that you paid When you died for me You conquered the death And you washed my sins away And though I am redeemed To live eternally with you I'm still a sinful man in the things that I do I say, Lord, have mercy Lord, have mercy on me Oh, I surrender From down here on my knees I say, please forgive my weakness, Lord Forgive my selfish need Oh, Lord, have mercy Lord, have mercy on me 
Well, thanks very much for coming out tonight. It's been lovely to meet you. I hope you've all understood what I've had to say because of my accent and what all. Um, you might have thought you were coming here to see me tonight, but I came here to see you. Um, I never thought nine years ago I'd be anywhere singing about Jesus. Right? Seriously, if you'd have told me that, I'd have bought you a pint. And uh, There you go, pal. But that's what I do, and I am immeasurably blessed. I don't know how, I mean, I don't know what, what it's just favour, you know. Um, I've never had any delusions of record labels or any of that stuff. I make my own CDs. I brought some if you fancy buying one. That's how I feed my kids, so no pressure. <laughs> um, no, I'm only joking. Good for Frisbees, you get a free case with every CD. And, uh, um... I believe I am called to share the gospel. I do, because I, I've seen what it does. It transforms lives. And you don't need to be homeless. You don't need to be an addict, you know. Jesus said he came so that we might know life in all its fullness. And even in its up and downs, man, it's been a rock and roll ride for the last nine years. I mean, it's just been mental. It's just been, it's just been daft. And... Um, Things are really just moving, and I mean, I, I don't always get it right, but I do try and, and be faithful. But when I do, the blessings just come and they pour out, you know. I've been, um, this year's just going to be ridiculous. I'm playing at some really big festivals and stuff. I've been, there's a guy in America called Ed Cash, he's a producer. He's, he's offered to produce my next album, and he's, he's really, he, he produced the last Chris Tomlin album. You might not know who he is, but he's, um, he he basically recorded the first Christian album that went to number one in the in the Billboard charts ever, and he was one of the producers. And he's offered to do my next one because he had um, my last album. So he's offered me a, a reduced rate, the independent artist rate, which comes in at a very comfortable twenty five thousand pounds instead of the one hundred thousand pounds that they normally charge. So we've been doing a bit of fundraising. And honestly, it's just been ridiculous, the things that, that have happened. I've been asked to do a two-week tour in Norway. I was there a couple of months ago, and this guy came up at the end. I told him about this, this, that I was trying to raise some money, and he said, would you come and play maybe in one of our hotels? He says, I own a hotel. And I was like, yeah, sure. So I got in touch with my agent. Turns out that he owns a chain of luxury spa resorts in the Norwegian fjords and all that, like about 15 of them. And he wants me to do a two-week tour in September. And he said, um, my agent said, well, he's got a 10-day rule. So if he's lo any longer than 10 days, his family either come with him or he's not doing it. Because I've been away from my family for two to three weeks and it's just unbearable, you know. And uh, so he said, well, why doesn't he come and do the two weeks? And then for the first weekend, we'll fly in his family, all expenses paid, to one of the resorts. And he can do the concerts at night, and his family will be there, and then we'll fly his family home. <laughs> and the funny bit is, they're actually going to pay me to do this, right? <laughs> they're going to pay me to do this. Um, it's just, it's just insane, and it's going to raise about nine grand towards the project. It's just amazing, you know. So it, we said we'd give this thing in America a go because if the money didn't come in, I mean, it was never going to happen, you know. So we just kind of went. If it's meant to be, it's meant to be. So it's just bizarre. So if you want to follow us on Facebook and find out who else we're meeting and just like ridiculous things happen, <laughs> I mean, it's just mental, man, you know. Um, we'd really like that if you just want to connect and, uh, and whatever. But I believe I'm called to share the gospel because there's loads of people out there that have never heard the gospel and I believe that at the very least they've got the right to hear it. And what you do with that is absolutely up to you because it's your God-given right to choose your own path. I've got a 15-year-old son, and I say to him, you know, mate, 
I would love you to share my faith. I would love that, but there's, it, it's, it's up to you. I mean, nobody can take that away from you. It's your God-given right to choose what you believe in your path, and I'll, I'll have to respect whatever you decide. But I encourage them to go out and search for answers, and don't just read Wikipedia, and you know, and just, I truly believe that if you seek God with all your heart and soul, you'll find them, you know? And I've seen how it transforms people, and how it heals people, and brings people back together. Have you ever wondered why the truly free things in life are amazing, like kindness, and compassion, and love, and friendship, and fellowship, and you can't buy these things. You can try and you can get an imitation of it, but these things are truly divine because they come from the goodness of, the, of God, you know? So if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'll say two things to you, right? One, you can, right? You don't need to press like. You don't need to subscribe or uh, give me your credit card details or any of that nonsense. You just need to ask him to come into your life. And secondly, I'll say, why, you know, why not? What have you got to lose? Really, what have you got to lose? And I'm only telling you this because my life has been transformed. And I'm not ashamed at all. I love what I do. I believe what I do. I, I believe I've seen this. You should have seen this guy last night in Edinburgh. He was an absolute nutter. We are doing a gig. And he came in and he went, Steph, how's it going, mate? And I was like, all right. <laughs> And he came in and says, I became a Christian six weeks ago. He's a cuddle. I was like, right, okay. And he just stood there and he just started telling me about what all, he, he was an alcoholic 30 years and suddenly he found faith. He says, I've brought my son tonight. He's struggling with heroin. I wanted him to hear the gospel. We love your music. I bought, you a ta- I bought one of your tapes. Bought one of your tapes. <laughs> and, uh, and he just says, I just, I'm just, and he just, he went round the room cuddling everybody. This guy, honestly. And I, and I was like, they should just put him, put him up on stage because he's such an encouragement. And we ended up saying, will you play this song, which I'm about to play the now? I says, I'll play it for you, mate, but just because you've encouraged me, you know what I mean? And he, the guy was just alive with love and burning for life, you know, because he'd, he'd found the grace of God. And it was just such an amazing thing to see. And um, you can have that if you want it, you know. But if... You just want to ask questions, you can do that too. So if you want to chat at the end, that would be great. Craig's here. Craig's a, a great guy. Um, the church service is tomorrow. It's um, Easter Sunday. That's the big day. That's going to be a great day. We're going to have some awesome stuff happening. So if you want to come along and eat some chocolate and, you know, get down to the nitty-gritty stuff, that would be, be awesome. Great to see you. I'm going to be doing the music for the worship and stuff, and there's going to be some stuff going on. But I just wanted to say thank you for listening and uh, I hope it's been all right. I hope you've uh, understood what I've been saying and stuff like that. So I just wanted to say thank you. You've been a lovely audience and you've actually sat and listened, which is really great. I really, really appreciate that. So thank you very much. And I'm just going to finish with one song. Um, it's called Jesus is Lord. And I wrote this. I just wanted to sing Jesus is Lord. That's all I wanted to do. I just, just wanted to sing. So I had to write a song around that, which was annoying because I just wanted to sing Jesus is Lord, but it doesn't really work if you do fact that Jesus is Lord for four minutes, you know. Um, it does in my head, but people are like, right, is that it? Right, okay, let's write, it, write a song. But this is um, Jesus is Lord, and I just, wanted, I just wanted to worship God, man, you know what I mean? I just wanted to worship God. So uh, you might know a couple of, I'm going to add a couple of bits in at the end that I didn't write, so you might be able to join in if you like. All right, can you sing? I hear, I hear when you get below Manchester, it's a bit dodgy, like, you know. <laughs> nope, that's a wrong song. I stand amazed. That's a wrong one song. I surrender all I am. Just to know your love's embrace Lead me down a righteous road And I'll run a righteous race You see death I fear no more For the truth that has set me free And I call to all the world Yeah, I was blind but now I see Your love for me 
is but amazing grace. Hallelujah, sing, Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is the Lord. Singing, Jesus is the Lord. He's the Lord of my heart and Lord of my soul. And on the dark and narrow path, the Lord be a lamp unto my feet. Every footstep in your name is my enemy's retreat. Upon the battlefield of faith, oh Lord, I'm going to fight this fight for you. Even in a fallen world, Lord, you are holy, you are just, and you are true, yeah. Amen. Your love for me is but amazing grace. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is the Lord. I say, Jesus is the Lord. He's the Lord of my heart, the Lord of my soul. I was forged in the fire of glory The day that I found you No longer was I weary I was remade, I was renewed And every moment you are with me Every time I sing your name The heart of fire within me, Lord It burns with the hardest flame, Jesus Jesus, Jesus, my Lord, my Lord, and I'm singing out, Jesus is the Lord, Jesus is the Lord, say Jesus is the Lord, he's the Lord of my heart and Lord of my soul, I said Jesus is the Lord, Lord. Say, Jesus is the Lord, He's the Lord of my heart and Lord of my soul. Say, Jesus is the Lord, He's the Lord of my heart and Lord of my soul. I say that Jesus is Lord, Lord of my heart. Mm -hmm. Oh, now this little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine I said this little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine I said this little light of mine Jesus, I'm gonna let it shine I'm gonna let it shine Let it shine I'm gonna let it shine Oh, this little light singing now This little light of mine Jesus, I'm gonna let it shine Oh, this little light of mine I said I'm gonna let it shine I said, this little light of mine, oh, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, I'm gonna let it shine, oh, when the saints, oh, when the saints, oh, go marching in, oh, and when the saints go marching in, I'm gonna be in that number when the saints go marching in for he is Lord he is Lord he is risen from the dead and he is alone and every knee shall bow and every tongue confess oh that Jesus 
Jesus Christ is alone. One more time. Thank you very much. So this is the uncomfortable bit where nobody knows whether to talk or move or get our jackets or what. So this is just waiting for Craig to mosey on up. Yes, well, I know that song. <laughs> We're saving it for tomorrow, but I've got to do it twice. All right. What now? I'm joking. Um, my 15-year-old son strengthens my faith more than anybody else I know. He's my stepson, but he um, he wears wears the McLeod name well. He's the only blonde in the family. But he's, uh, he's amazing, and um, I told you that he, I encouraged him to go out and ask questions, and he comes back with some absolute whoppers, honestly. I'm actually really fortunate I know smarter people than me, um, good counsel. And um, he said to me once, he's really quite crafty, he said to me, if, uh, if God told you to go in the X Factor, would you do it? <laughs> now, if, if you, you probably don't know me at all, but I cannot stand reality TV and Fix Factor and Britain's Got Desperate, honestly. <laughs> R right now we're in that lovely moment, lovely moment where the football season's coming to the end. There's no X Factor, there's no Britain's Got Desperate. It's just wonderful. Um, I'm not allowed to watch it in the house either. I get banished to the man room because um, I'm the unwanted commentary. They're not even singing, they're not even singing, look. Keeps my kids in on a Saturday, I suppose. But uh. so he said, "Would you go into Would you Would you go into the X Factor if God told you to?" And I went, "You're crafty." I said, "Yes, I'd do it." And he went, "But you hate the X Factor." And I was like, "Yes, I do." And he says, "So why would you do it?" And I said, "Because Jesus went to the cross for me." And he went, "That has got absolutely nothing to do <laughs> with the X Factor." And I was like, right, let's, let's back up a bit. I said, where was, Jay, where was Jesus the night before he was crucified? And I honestly, he said something along the lines of uh, he was having his dinner, right, which is the Last Supper. Right, honestly, it's just crazy the way teenagers' minds work. But he said, um, uh, he was having his tea. I said, right, where was he after that? And he went, no idea. I said, well, he was in the garden and he was praying. I said, remember what he was praying for? He went, no. I said, well, he was begging God not to make him go through with what he was sent to do because he was so terrified. Crucifixion was the most abhorrent form of execution that they ever, ever designed. It was designed to be slow and painful and horrible. And Jesus was so scared that he sweat drops of blood. That's a rare thing, you know. But he knew it had to be him. 
and now I couldn't have been anybody else. I couldn't be anybody. He knew what he was going to suffer. He knew that he was going to be in pain. And, but it never once crossed his mind on the day that he was beaten that we weren't worth dying for. Not once. And when I spoke to James about that, and I said, you know what, if God told me to go on the X Factor, it would be nothing compared to what Christ did for me on the cross. And then I started to write this song, The Passion. It was originally called The Easter Song, because I couldn't think of anything better to call it. But um, I wanted to get back to what the crucifixion really was. I wanted to know what it would be like to be there, to stand and watch what Jesus was going through for me. And I wrote this song about 50 times. Honestly, I've got some crazy demos in the house. They're all rot rotten. <laughs> but it, was, it just wasn't there. And it took a whole year till I got to the bit when I thought, you know what, I'll start thinking about the resurrection as well. And it just started to fall into place. And then I wrote this song. And um, that just tore me to bits. And uh, I got a chance to record it. We got this um, famous Scottish choir to record it in St. Giles Cathedral. It was really very Lord of the Rings, by the way. It was the most incredible thing. And my mate went and put an orchestra behind it as well. He does like um, the music for TV shows like Sherlock and um, uh, done one of the uh, Narnia movies and stuff. Put an orchestra behind it. It was just unbelievable because it was just me and a guitar to start with. So. This is called The Passion, and it's just about being at the cross to see what Jesus actually did for us, you know what I mean? To see the reality of what happened and what he did, because tomorrow, I mean, that's it's just what I want to sing about. So this is called The Passion. You're going to have to imagine there's an orchestra, all right? Lead me, Jesus, show me the cross, let me fall down at the feet of my redemption's cause. I see the nails through your hands and feet, labored skin body torn and the blood that falls from the king of kings crowned in a plate of thorns such an act of love the world had never seen until the day you gave your life for me Lead me, Jesus Show me your fate You became all of my sin you die there in my place have me look deep in your eyes amid the mocking ridicule as you cry father forgive them they know not what they do mm -hmm. Such an act of love The world had never seen Until the day 
that you gave your life for me. Oh, for me. Precious Jesus, the light of the world faded away. You paid with your life when I was to blame. But death could not hold you, and the grave could not keep you. And up in an ocean of light. Oh, Jesus, you rose, Jesus, you rose, in a light of glory, and you did it all, all for me, Jesus, you an act of mercy since there has never been never been again and now I know life I know life oh my Lord cause I believe in you and only you such an act of love the world had never seen That you would give your life That you would rise again, my King I believe in you My God, my King Blessed Savior, precious Jesus, you did it all, you did it all for me. Mm. Oh, blessed Savior, you did it all for me. I surrender all I am To know your love's embrace Lead me down a righteous road And I'll run a righteous race You see death I fear no more For the truth has set me free And I call to all the world I was blind but now I see Yes, your love for me is but amazing grace Hallelujah, sing Jesus is Lord Jesus 